So back to the jury, and uh, while you're looking at that, I, I would like to review a moment uh, some of the things I said yesterday and <clears throat> get your attention again and uh, so we can get some continuity despite the overnight break. I hope you slept well. I did. Uh, I was telling you that as a clinical psychologist, I was attempting to render my best professional opinion addressing the issue of the defendant's state of mind at the time of commission of the crimes. That as a psychologist, I reviewed extensive records, police documents, professional professionals who had evaluated him over the last few years. I saw Mr. Dahmer on three occasions. I interviewed members of his family, and uh, I attempted to observe him. I took note of what his life history was prior to the commission of the crimes, focusing on the crimes themselves, what he was like afterward, and certainly at the time I saw him, I administered what is called a mental status examination, and I told you some of those results, which I will summarize. And this morning, I would like to tell you about the test results. I did give him three tests, and one of them is a test called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory that comes out with an answer sheet, which I cannot show you because it tends to make obvious to the public and to you the kinds of items that are used on the test. It's a true-false instrument. The test is scored either by hand or by computer, and the test results are imprinted on a profile sheet, which is before you. That is uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's profile with the date of testing as January 4, 1992. The test is most useful in a situation where you're attempting to uncover the individual's psychopathology, abnormalities, what kind of quirks, what kinds of problems he or she has. It's used in both outpatient settings and in hospital settings. It is recognized as the most valid personality test of all the many hundreds of tests used. It is valid in the sense that it measures what it is supposed to measure, and what it measures here is an individual's abnormalities. The test was constructed by comparing the item responses of a large group of normal people that provide a standardization and larger subgroups of abnormal individuals with particular diagnoses. And at this point, I could tell you that the diagnoses at the time the test was standardized in 1939 are substantially different from the diagnoses that are used today. And I believe you will likely be instructed that the kind of di diagnosis is arbitrary. As you heard yesterday, diagnoses are merely guides. I will go over some of the diagnoses with you and attempt to clarify the difference between what was true in 1939 and what is true today in 1992. So I, I will proceed to the uh, projector and show you a few things to help you understand what Mr. Dahmer was like in January of 1992. How can I best be heard? Is this uh, okay? Doctor, I think the important thing is that you project your voice well. First of all, we have to have the jurors hear you, we have yeah. to have counsel hear you, and we don't have a record unless the court reporter hears you. Right, well, uh, all those people cannot 
safely understand, please let me know. I, I, I'm not good at shouting, but I will. Uh, I don't have any problem. Okay, if any member of the jury has a problem hearing the doctor at any point, can you kindly raise your hand? The court reporter, I think, knows what to do if she can't hear. Please. Okay. Uh, as the test is represented, the left portion of the test from the dark vertical line over under where it says male are validity scales. One of the positive features of the test is that it not only tells you what it measures, but it tells you about the test taking attitude of the patient, whether he was defensive, whether he lied, whether he tried to look good, whether he tried to look bad, and what his attitude was. So that helps you interpret his scores. Right of the dark vertical line are the scores on a variety of abnormal conditions that are found out there in the world, 1939 as well as in 1992. A way of understanding the squiggles here, which are, which is why the test is called multiphasic, is as follows. If you think of the first three scales, I don't know whether you can see the fine print. They are labeled HS or one, D or two, HY or three. These are the scales that are considered to be psychoneurotic disorders. As Dr. Lermo told you yesterday, they are often considered people who are not mentally ill. Psychologists in general don't know, don't use the term mental illness or even recognize that anyone is sick. These are people with disorders, with behavioral reactions. It's not necessary to think of people as ill or sick. But whatever they are, these would be the lesser degrees of disturbance, sometimes called the walking well, individual who seek counseling by psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and so forth. The first scale here is HS or hypochondriasis, which is no longer used. In 1992, that scale would be called ketomatization disorder. This is the individual's preoccupation with his physical condition. If he has lots of aches and pains and complaints, the scale goes up. I should interrupt to point out to you that these two horizontal lines represent a rough range of normality. Nearly every scale is above that range, suggesting that the individual taking the test is acutely disturbed. He's upset, he's uncomfortable with himself, he is indicating that he has many, many problems in many areas. The second scale is depression, which today, in 1992, is called dysthymia, if you hear that term. It's a difficult Greek word, means difficulty in mood. Uh, there are some indications here of depression or dysthymia. HY is the third scale, and that term is no longer used. It is hysteria is now likely to be something of the order of dissociative reaction. It refers to individuals who repress their feelings, who also develop somatic symptoms or dissociate or engage in denial. That scale is not terribly high relatively. The middle two scales are considered the character personality disorder scale, four and five. His highest score is on the four scale. The four scale, the original version of the test, was labeled as psychopathic deviant. That's a good illustration of how terms change. Back before even I practiced, which is shortly after the cooling of the earth, the individual diagnosis was called CPI a term which is even terrible to think about because it was called constitutional psychopathic inferior. 
you wouldn't want to know a CPI. But that term was later changed to psychopath or psychopathic deviant. In more contemporary terms, it was changed from character disorder to personality disorder. And this is the diagnosis that Dr. Palermo and Dr. and, and I both agree is his primary diagnosis. The term paraphilia, if you've heard used, is not reflected in these diagnoses. It's relatively recent. It appeared with the DSM-3R. At the time, the test was established in 1939 and up to DSM-2, which was in the 1950s. The paraphilias, same behavior, same disorders, were considered sexual deviations and were reflected in the PD scale which you will notice is Mr. Dahmer's highest scale. Scale five, which is a form of character disorder scale, is MF, MF standing for masculinity, femininity, and merely indicates the kinds of responses that are characterized by males in our society as opposed to females in our society. Mr. Dahmer, gives responses which are a trifle unusual for males or a little higher than expected, but not dramatically so. From scale six on is considered a psychotic portion, the more serious forms of behavior disorders or mental illnesses as you wish. The scales in order are scale six, paranoia, scale seven, a very strange term called psychasthenia. Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists like to take words from the Latin or Greek. Psychasthenia means weakness of the mind, but was the scale that was designed for individuals with fears, with obsessions, with compulsions. Scale eight is the most frequent major mental disorder behavior problem known as schizophrenia, and you've all heard of that. That is his second highest scale. Scale nine is designated MA, which is short for hypomania, which is a lesser degree of mania or overactivity. Scale zero is SI for social introversion. It doesn't represent a major mental disorder, but merely gives you a picture of whether the individual is more extroverted, outgoing, people-oriented, or introverted, withdrawn into himself. That is his lowest scale toward the extroverted end. Over here, there are four scales which are properly used, and they're considered auxiliary scales. They give you additional information. The scale here is worthy of attention. It is labeled MAC for McAndrew. It is very high, up to 40. There are only 46 items available. The scale is designed to pick up or diagnose individuals with personalities which are associated with alcohol, severe alcohol problems, the likelihood of alcohol addiction, or the term that was used yesterday, alcohol dependence. So that would be a likely secondary diagnosis would be compatible with that. The profile itself is diagnostically most compatible with a serious personality disorder. Not to inflate my credentials any more than necessary. I, I did study under the test author or start our pathway. I've used the test. I've given workshops in the test. Classes in the test. I am still called on, usually by others in the state of Wisconsin, for interpretation. I am quite comfortable, however, with the idea that other expert interpreters, and there are many throughout the country, 
classify this particular profile in the same way I do, which is a serious personality disorder, albeit an individual who perceived himself in distress as in the elevated D score, and also on the psychotic end, clearly indicating present discomfort, potential for uh, more aggravated adjustment. Having looked at the tests that preceded this going back to 86 and 89, this end in December and January for the last couple months is more elevated. And I interpreted this particular test as indicating the results of incarceration. It is no fun sitting in jail in isolation being peaked at with uh, no regard to privacy, with conditions that are clearly designed to uh, aggravate one's mental state. In uh, 1989, this end was substantially lower. I, I don't have that profile to show you. So that is the results of the MMPI multiphasic personality inventory. You may want to take that down. Yeah. Okay, that uh, essentially is the results in my interpretation of the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. That was one of the three tests I used to evaluate Mr. Dahmer. The other two were the Rorschach ink blots and the thematic apperception test. These are both projective tests, which I explained to you a little about yesterday. The individual is given a chance to impose his own personality traits, values, states onto the test material. The MMPI is the objective test that gives you actuarial uh, computerized interpretations. And uh, my whole career has tended to emphasize the value of objective tests. But the projective tests, in this case, the Rorschach, and the TAT yielded similar results. He looked at uh, 10 Rorschach cards, gave me 13 responses. He was able to see the things that most people see, which are called popular responses. I perhaps should have brought you in one. I'm allowed to show you one card, but there's one that nearly everybody says is either a bat or a butterfly, and that's exactly what Mr. Dahmer saw. Some of the cards have color, some have shading. He gave me 13 responses that are absolutely conventional, popular, a trade term is mundane, meaning that uh, they are used throughout the world. He was somewhat defensive, which is true of many, many individuals who are either under arrest or in, in incarceration settings. They tend to clam up and they don't produce as much as they should. Although Mr. Dahmer's history is one of not giving of himself to educational-like tasks throughout his uh, academic career. The PAT, the stories, are things that you would popularly expect from uh, normal adolescents and adults all over. They are so trivial that you know, they are not uh, striking enough to give you any examples of abnormality. I would opine that the average psychologist looking at the Rorschach and TAT responses <coughs> would likely pick up that these were defensive individuals who are not giving of themselves, but they would not pick up any evidence of either neuroses or psychoses, such as I illustrated on the uh, slide projector for you. So we have a situation where the objective test, the MMPI, was the most helpful 
diagnostically. And those are, in general, the results of the tests and my interpretation of them. I would like to go over my concluding paragraph, which summarized my findings and hope to make that clear to you. I said that a summary of my test and clinical findings is consistent with the DSM-3R diagnosis of 301.90. I could have said and should have said that I am also considering all the records I reviewed. I am considering my interview impressions, facts from the history as I gathered from him, his relatives, and others. And this all led to the embracing concept of 30190 personality disorder not otherwise specified. As you heard yesterday, this diagnosis replaced the formerly used diagnosis in the previous nomenclature handbook called Mixed Personality Disorder, which is to say that he has features of many personality disorders, but the, it is difficult to pick out one that is so paramount or so striking you'd want to apply that label so you're safer off with mixed and indicate that he has features of other disorders. And in my report, I said that the diagnosis personality disorder not otherwise specified includes features of, I won't read you the code numbers because they're confusing, Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which indicates that he has repetitious ideas and rituals that go over and over again. Borderline personality disorder, a lengthy history of maladjustment with difficulty in maintaining relationships and often exhibiting problematic behaviors. And sadistic personality disorder, which reflects the nature of the crimes with which he is charged. I must say at this point that if I wanted to modernize my thinking and use the term paraphilia, I was struck with some of the testimony, particularly by my colleague, Dr. Becker, and assuming that she elicited from her interviews a greater preoccupation with bodies of the dead than I elicited, I, I certainly would be willing to indicate that Mr. Dahmer does exhibit paraphilic or necrophilic features. If this were true, I would yet maintain that as a paraphile, he falls within the larger, much larger category of individuals who behave in the way they do, but who are not psychotic. Mr. Dahmer is not psychotic. At the time of the evaluation, Mr. Dahmer is judged to be inaccessible to psychotherapy. He is not motivated. The prison setting is not conducive to psychotherapy anyway. But as a psychologist, I am interested in him as a person, no matter how horrible the crimes, and hoping that something can be done to reconstruct this individual who certainly has assets of youth and intelligence. So I say a later effort in this regard is warranted. In addressing the issue of criminal responsibility, which is what I was told to do, it can be stated that there is no substance to an NGI plea not guilty by reason of insanity. At the time of the alleged offenses, Mr. Dahmer was fully able to appreciate right from wrong and to conform his conduct to the dictates of the law. And I indicated to the judge if he had any questions he could ask me. This might be his opportunity. But that would conclude my findings. Yep. Doctor, I think that's the role of the lawyers in the case. Uh, Mr. Boyle, cross-examination. Good morning, Dr. Good morning, Mr. Boyle.
Doctor, um, I'm going to try and hopefully ask you to uh, educate me and the jury on some questions that are troublesome, okay? Fine. Now, the test is, you, you, you conclude there's no substance in the insanity defense. What you mean by that is that since there is no evidence, as far as you are concerned, that he was suffering from a mental disease, the first prong of the test has not been met. You know what you mean? Both prongs not been met. Your first prong is not met. There's no mental we're, disease. We're concentrating on the first. Yes, okay. And if there's no mental disease, then everyone can conform their conduct to requirements of law, correct? Yes. Okay, so if I'm unable to persuade, pursuant to my burden, that there was a mental disease, uh, any person situated in your professional posture would say, then I cannot find as a psychological basis that a person couldn't conform their conduct to requirements of law. That's how the test goes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we hear this word psychosis often in this courtroom. How many psychoses are there? Strike that. Let me ask you this way. Are all people who you people call psychotic or having a psychosis then mentally ill? Well, again, as I indicated to the jury, it depends on who is doing the labeling. Okay, let me ask you then. I tell you, I say, assume that I have a friend and his name is Mr. Smith and there's something wrong with him and you see him and you say, you were right, Mr. Smith is psychotic. Does that mean he's mentally ill? Yeah, in saying he's psychotic, I guess due to my training and experiences, I adopt the traditional framework of all diagnosticians and would say to you he is mentally ill, just as in, in the courtroom today, I have to grapple with problems of what constitutes sanity and insanity, sure. which the literature says have uh, often poor correspondence with uh, psychological, psychiatric studies. I, I just missed something you said there. Would you repeat just the latter part of what you said? Or, or I, repeat I, your answer, please. Yeah, you know, I said I, I, I can rephrase it perhaps. Please. As I sit here, I have to grapple with an often poor correspondence between the sanity issues, which are a legal term, and the issues of psychological, psychiatric practice, which are of course. Not, not the same. Two different disciplines, I understand it. Yes. That's why I'm asking these questions. In the, in the question of logic, are all people in your profession that are found to be psychotic suffering from a mental illness? It is more likely that uh, a large sample of psychiatrists would agree that they're mentally ill than a large sample of psychologists, although the preponderance of psychologists, if asked whether or no, would agree that that's mental illness. Now, let's take the two groups, the, the great body of psychiatrists who would say psychotics, people who are psychotic or suffering some, uh, from a psychosis are mentally ill. Would that mean that under the ALI test, they would also say that that mental illness is a mental disease? Uh, my experience in doing forensic work tells me that uh, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. So, 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 so what you're saying to me is if I had psychiatrist A and he says, Mr. Smith is suffering from a psychosis, I conclude that to be a mental illness, but I don't conclude it to be a mental disease for the legal purposes. He could say that. That's correct. 
And the next psychiatrist would say, you know, I find the same psychosis in Mr. A, and I also consider it to be a mental illness, and I think it's a mental disease within the concept of the legal definition. True? Yes, I might add that it's even worse than that, if you wish me to found yeah. that uh, it will co-vary with uh, what side of the adversary process the uh, psychiatrist is likely on, but e even among honest practitioners. Let's take it out of the courtroom. Let's just take okay. it in a, you know, we're having an academic discussion on PBS, and we take it out of the courtroom. So that, that, that the effect of their finding is going to make any difference to anyone other than the educational process, all right? All right. Then what I've said is right. Psychiatrist A, psychosis, mental illness, not mental disease. Psychiatrist B, psychosis, mental illness, mental disease, right? Perfectly possible. Now... The examiner of these two psychiatrists on this panel would say, define psychosis so that we can then go to A and B and find out why these very brilliant people, and I mean that sincerely, why these brilliant people on the one hand find a disease and the other hand the other guy doesn't find a disease. So therefore I ask you to help us and tell me what a psychosis is. Good examination question. The psychosis is a serious form of behavior and or mental disorder in which there are disturbances of the either the sense of reality or reality itself. How is it that reasonable psychiatric Doctors and, well, I'm only going to psychiatrists now because you said psychologists disagree more so than even do psychiatrists. How could the reasonable psychiatrist say that a person who is psychotic, who is suffering from a mental illness, that that mental illness is not a disease? Well, there are a couple problems involved. One uh, bears on the well-known fact in our field that uh, psychiatric diagnosis is horribly unreliable, meaning that uh, psychiatrists don't agree among themselves to begin with. The other problem is the individual psychiatrist's notion of the correspondence of his findings to the so-called legal tests. Okay. Now, the same academic discussion with these same psychiatrists, we say to them, Assume that the law says, Dr. A and B, that a mental disease is an impairment of the mind. And the questions then put to Dr. A and B, is the psychosis that you find an um, impairment of the mind? Would they both answer that yes? May not, the, really? because the term impairment of the mind may not have sufficient specificity and be corresponding to their training. They may make their individual interpretations of that term. If I were to ask you if Jeffrey Dahmer, at the time he committed these offenses, was suffering from an impairment of the mind, what would you say? Uh, I would have to hedge because I, I am not clear as to what that means relative to my training and diagnostic skills. So therefore, if I say to you, doctor, you say that he was not suffering from a mental disease because he did not have an impairment of the mind, you would say, well, you can't. Can you say that he didn't have an impairment of the mind? Well, perhaps the best way to answer that would be to indicate that I did append a diagnostic label and it's close enough to the DSM-3R, which as you pointed out yesterday, it says Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So that's close to impairment of the mind. Okay. Now, when Jeffrey Dahmer was doing the things he was doing with whatever his mind was all about, would the thing that he was doing, as the law says, this impairment of the mind, was it enduring or transitory? Do you understand those words? Sure. What, what do those words mean, enduring or transitory? Well, it would be similar to chronic or acute, which is the more typical psychiatric psychological language. 
Enduring would be uh, lasting for considerable lengths of time. Transitory would mean it comes and goes. Hey, what, 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 what about with Jeffrey Dahmer? He, he, he indicated that he didn't have a mental disease, but whatever he was doing in his mind, was that an enduring thing or was it transitory? What I indicated as a personality disorder was of an enduring nature. So it was going on for a long period of time? Yes. Did whatever his mindset was, which you say was not psychotic, it was enduring, that was, it was going over a long period of time, <laughs> did it affect, just affect, his mental processes? Yes, you know, I, I think uh, the entirety of his lifespan is conceptualized, it would affect everything he said and did. How about his emotional processes? Similarly. Okay, now, whatever his mindset was, when whatever he was doing, did whatever he had in his mind, this enduring problem, because it was a problem, disorder is a problem, right? Yes, sir. Did it substantially affect his mental and emotional processes? The disorder is always there, so it, is, so it affected it. Yes. Substantially. Yeah, substantially or insubstantially, it is sure. just, it's a given. So, I want to go back then to what you tell us to do when you got Dr. A saying that this person's psychosis is a mental illness, which is a mental disease. This person's psychosis is a mental illness, but is not a mental disease. Help us decide how we can make a judgment as to whether Dr. A or Dr. B knows what they're talking about. I would pertain to my belief in the jury system. I uh, believe that the uh, and admittedly relatively unsophisticated people who could hear experts who could reduce their findings to understandable terms, they're the best criterion. Terrific. Now, doctor, you're, believe me, this is very helpful. Here's, here's what I have to ask you about the difference between enduring and transitory. All of us, everybody, comes across people who are mentally ill, who are psychotic, right? I mean, we all do sometime in our life suddenly meet somebody, maybe for five minutes, maybe a lot of times, who is really suffering from a mental illness. They're likely in every street and block and every community. Lawyers, as you know, are appointed as guardian ad litems. Yes, sir. And that is to make sure that they go out and talk to someone who is being held somewhere to see whether or not that person is being held properly or improperly in a report back to the court. That happens, doesn't it? Yes. Competency. That, sir? Competency issues. Well, well, sure, but people who under, uh, not, uh, yeah, competency, not, not criminal competency, right. just competency. Sure. And lawyers are lay people because they've had, or most of us, have not had any training in your discipline or psychiatric discipline. It is clear, and you know from your own experience, that you can have a discussion with a person for a period of time and suddenly say something to that person that triggers their schizophrenia. True? Absolutely. Or their paranoia. That too. In other words, you could have a 25-minute discussion with somebody who had been in Vietnam and talk to that person about sports and history and how the, how the world is going and everything is fine. And then suddenly you say to them, Do you, did you ever travel to the Far East? And that person can go like right out, right? I could further illustrate that if you wish. Sure, please do. It's true, but yeah. I can think of one or two cases I have seen. Uh, one man being incarcerated uh, in where I think Dr. Wallstrom worked, the Illinois State Psychiatric Institute, where I was conducting board exams. 
who was given a colleague of, who was given to a colleague of mine for a board examination, who sat with my colleague for about half an hour and didn't say a word. It's called mutism. Uh, and he went out, uh, the colleague, very upset because he could not get his work done or establish a record. So he went back to the staff psychiatrist who had picked out the patient and said, you should not have given me a patient who doesn't talk. And he says, uh, ask him about the Zodiac. And uh, he went back in the room with the evidently mute patient and said, tell me about the Zodiac. And just a flood of words and speech began. There are other illustrations of that where individuals will confine evidence of psychotic process to a even a very narrow area of their life. Uh, I, I think that illustration is maybe sufficient. Thank you. Uh, it's been reported that, that lawyers will say something to people who they think of, feel are just fine and uh, ask a, a trigger question and suddenly the psychosis comes out. That happens. Yes. Now, you have never, ever run across anything as horrific as this situation as a psychologist, have you? Only in reading newspaper accounts, but never myself, yeah. correct. Jeffrey Dahmer, in your report, you use the word lust and control. Yes. It's your belief that his mindset was to achieve lust and control, right? Did I believe that that was... Yes, sir. Yes, that's correct. There's a lot of people in the world who have terrible lust problems, correct? Yes. And there's a lot of people in the world, and we read about them in sexual harassment cases, who control the object of their lust in such a way that they're able, because of what they do and how they do it, to achieve their objective by controlling a person, either by force, money, status, position, to get them to succumb to their lust desires, right? That is correct. Sure. That's not, that's just a bad person, <laughs> normally, correct? Uh, most of us wouldn't like that kind of person. That's right. So therefore, when you talk about the lust and control of Jeffrey Dahmer... What was the object of his lust? As I understood it, it was well-developed young men who were conventionally handsome or attractive to Mr. Dahmer. And what did his lust desire? I mean, let, 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 let me just say this. Let's say that the, the man who I've described in the, in the power play Maybe his lust, his lust is just to have the person with him hanging around with them and has no desire to have sex with them. Jeffrey Dahmer, and that still would be an object of lust, but Jeffrey Dahmer's lust certainly went farther than to just have contact with people like that. He wanted to do something with them, right? Yes, sir. And in order to do that, he decided in his mindset to control them, right? Yes. And over the pattern of his years in this control, he started doing different things, did he not? Yes. And there was a break in his pattern under his lust and control because a couple of times his object was not a live person. In one instance, if you believe him, it was a mannequin. In another instance, it was a potential corpse that had already uh, uh, passed on and was buried, if you believe that. That was a part of his lust. Among other things, yes. Sure. And of course, even then, there would have been control because he would have controlled the place where it took place and what he did when he was doing the fulfillment of his lust, correct? Correct. <laughs> but we see changes in Jeffrey Dahmer on his desire for the effect of his lust because now he starts drugging people, right? Correct. 
So the object of his mindset is lust and control, and he does that. But that isn't enough. He does more, right? Yes. He, he now, in this, whatever his disordered thinking character process is, <laughs> the enduring part of it is to get the person back into his apartment to provide the fulfillment of his lust, which is, in your professional opinion, what? What is the purpose of the lust when he starts taking these poor men back to his apartment? Well, as a result of careful and methodical planning, he can accomplish the fulfillment of both motives, both lust and control. You did not make a finding that he was a necrophilia. In my original report, I did not include that as even a uh, paramount feature. Nor did Dr. Uh, Palermo until he added it orally yesterday. Yes, sir. There's nothing. I, I just hope it's understood that I have the greatest respect for you, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. Why, after, well, first of all, did you ever have treated, do, do you treat, I mean, I, I was so impressed with your teaching mode here. Do you also treat? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you ever have a necrophiliac before? I searched my memory, and I, I do recall one individual who was a mortuary attendant who was accused, never admitted to me, and therefore was inconclusive. But this is an extremely rare disorder, and he, he would be the only one who approximated it. The other, the other fella that I, I trust was a fella, the other fella that he never admitted that he really had this anyway, so you couldn't make the conclusion. If he told you, I, listen, I really want to do this, then you would have said, well, you're clearly a necrophilia, right? Yeah, you know, there, there should be, you know, by definition, some evidence that that disorder was present. And... Did you, as you sit here now, believe based upon all of the admissions that he has made to all the various professionals and all the various police, that if someone were to ask you hypothesis on the basis of all of those facts, without ever having seen him, would you say this man in my hypothetical professional opinion would be a necrophiliac? Sitting here today, I, I, I would say he has features of that disorder. Okay. Now, <laughs> without trying to bore anyone with definitions, the paraphilic definition is that a person has a constant preoccupational... Let me read it. Better than I do that. Well, can you tell me the definition of paraphilia, please? Well, it's love or affection for an unusual uh, object. It, the book. Do you like the I, book or don't you like the book? I, I use it on occasion, but uh, not too frequently, actually. This book says that the essential feature of sexual disorders is a recurrent, intense sexual urge <laughs> and sexually arousing fantasies generally involving either non-human objects the suffering or humiliation of oneself or one's partner, not merely simulated, or children or other non-consenting persons. The diagnosis is made only if the person has acted on these urges or is markedly distressed by them. In other classifications, these disorders are referred to as sexual deviations. The term paraphilia is preferable because it correctly emphasizes the deviation, para, lies in that to which the person is attracted, the philia. Did Jeffrey Dahmer have, in your professional opinion, recurrent, intense sexual urges and sexually arousing fantasies to have contact with dead bodies, corpses, and 
Was he markedly distressed by them? The most honest response I can give you is that I, I was aware of some activity and preoccupation with dead bodies as a result of the interviews I had, the materials given me. I gathered the utmost respect for Dr. Becker, who clearly works in this specialty area, and was impressed by her telling the jury that he had sexual contact after death with all his victims. I tend to doubt that because as a psychologist, uh, I'm always skeptical of what people tell me, because what people tell me is uh, has a large self-serving element. But she proved to be an excellent historian and probably interviewer, and I, I would say if even half of the victims, or some proportion doesn't have to be half, show the preoccupation that Mr. Boyle has described, I would be willing to say that uh, he had distinct necrophilic or paraphilic features, although it requires a stretch for me because it's, it's a sexual deviation. I was brought up with the term sexual deviation. Yeah. But you see, whatever the terms we call them, if they rise psychologically or psychiatrically to an impairment of the mind, then it doesn't matter what we call them, correct? In terms of the legal necessity, I think, to uh, formulate. Right. Okay. So, you know, if, 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 if I have a fetish... <clears throat> for mushrooms and all day long all I do is go about the business of picking mushrooms taking mushrooms thinking of mushrooms cooking mushrooms and I don't go to work or I only work enough so that I can continue to go out and pick mushrooms and I drive my car all over town looking for mushroom patches, and I'm not taking care of my wife and children because I'm so preoccupied with mushrooms, and then it's showing that the reason is is that mushrooms get me so sexually excited, and I got to have them with me, somebody might say, there's something wrong with that guy, right? You would need a very understanding family. <laughs> and I better not get poisoned either, right? Okay, right. Question is... That can be an impairment if I am so overset by something that I can't function otherwise in a normal fashion, one might say that I have an impairment of the mind no matter what you call it. Probably so, although if you existed in an environment that allowed you to do those things, uh, you might argue that the impairment would be minimized. Now, I want to ask you a question. If all of us have never known anyone who had necrophilia, and none of us have ever known anyone who slaughtered 15 people in the manner and form in which Mr. Dahmer did, and if none of us have ever met a person who had such intense sexual desires and if none of us have ever known someone who got sexual arousal from this conduct on a recurrent basis over and over again with a preoccupation, then certainly reasonable minds may differ as to whether or not that person's condition was a mental impairment, correct? Objection. That's a hypothetical. Sister. Dr. Is it not safe to say, just as you told us before about Dr. A saying psychosis, mental illness, not mental disease, Dr. B coming to exactly the same conclusion saying psychosis, mental illness, mental disease, that reasonable psychiatrists and reasonable psychologists looking at exactly the same set of facts can arrive at different conclusions? May I expound on that a bit? And, Please. Uh, 
I hope I'm not out of line, but I have a concern which helps me uh, address your question. That is with regard to the concept of paraphilia, as I now understand it somewhat better as a result of hearing previous witnesses, and a concern for other aspects of my professional life that have me deal with similar disorders, whether they're called mental or behavioral or what have you. One specifically is called post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'll try to explain that a little bit, but back to paraphilia. My understanding of the literature, which is not the most sophisticated or intensive in the world, but I do read and I'm familiar with DSM-3R, and I was very impressed with Dr. Becker's testimony. Uh, I'm impressed with the conceded notion that uh, not very many paraphilics are considered to be psychotic. Most of them exist in terms of the old-fashioned character disorder, personality disorder, sexual deviates. But I detected in the literature that I know and in the testimony of the defense witnesses a tendency to want to decriminalize behaviors that traditionally, in my understanding of the legal process, do not exculpate that, you know, if you have a character disorder, a sexual deviation, you are responsible because you have, you heard the term choice, you have free will. To say that a paraphilic meets the test of insanity is to decriminalize a whole bunch of people, just as post-traumatic stress disorders are now used to exculpate various crimes, and I understand there is case information that there are two Vietnam veterans uh, who were found not guilty because of insanity due to a post-traumatic stress disorder. That's decriminalizing behavior that, by my experience and understanding, uh, is still governed by free choice. And uh, so I, I guess a summary is that I am fearful of a tendency which I see now in the latter days of my career for both psychologists and psychiatrists to grab onto a whole bunch of disorders and say this is somehow determined by society's experience. There's a recent one which has been in the Milwaukee News, which you may have read, that uh, uh, kids who go around uh, killing people or shooting people for their coats or sneakers are uh, uh, victims of post-traumatic stress disorder because they've been brought up in a uh, impoverished environment and they're affected by discrimination and poverty and hence must be found not guilty. If anything is crazy in life, that's crazy because it you know, reduces the uh, NGI process to a shambles. Now, let's get back to talking about the policy statement you just made. You don't think for one moment that it is being suggested before this jury in this court that all people who suffer the disorder of paraphilia, necrophilia, not otherwise specified, are being claimed to be mentally diseased under the ALI test. You're not suggesting for one moment that that posture is being taken in any questions that I've asked. No, I was using the term psychotic, and I think uh, there's evidence people said that just a very few are psychotic. That's right. Okay. So what we're talking about, and there isn't any person in the world that's going to take issue with your policy statement. No one can rightfully take issue with what you said. But each and every case you know as a professional has to be dealt with on an individual basis, correct? Yes, sir. And it is on each and every individual case that a jury decides whether or not counsel has proved to them to their satisfaction by the appropriate burden of proof as to whether this, this man's mental 
business rose to the level of mental disease, correct? Yes, sir. Right. And you also know, and it was asked, and I believe by me, that it is rarely, rarely, where paraphilic behavior ever rises to the level of mental disease as testified to by the experts I called. You heard that? Yes. Okay. So we're talking not about the general policies, which I'll stipulate to, we're talking about a specific case with specific things happening in a specific case. Correct? Yes. Now, assume, assume that you as a professional found that rarity of a person suffering from a paraphilic disorder and assume that you made and came to the conclusion that that person's paraphilic order rose to the level that it impaired that person's mind, that it was enduring in nature, and that it substantially affected that person's mental processes at the time he did something, you wouldn't have any problem at all of postulating that in a court of law based upon your analysis of the totality of the case, would you? That's correct. Okay. So that you're not taking issue with the fact that someone like you, Dr. Friedman, someone as qualified as you, would come to a conclusion or an opinion opposite you because you're fearful that if that was believed, it might be a tendency to blow up the decriminalization system in the American system of justice. You're not really concerned about that, are you? Uh, I, I guess my concern would... Uh be that there could be developing a body of beliefs that would extend mental health professionals into believing that uh, a greater preponderance of paraphilics uh, have the mental disease that you specify. But that would be up then to your discipline to make sure that's pleased so that didn't take place. I hope so. Yes, right. Let's talk about the example of the Vietnam veteran who seven or eight years after he leaves Vietnam with all of the stressors that happened over there and all of the problems that many of these fine young men faced when they came back, suddenly is acting out and he commits an offense and a doctor like yourself, very, very experienced person says, you know, there is a new thing now that has developed for these soldiers who have been in these kind of situations and it's called post-traumatic shock syndrome and when that poor fellow was doing what he was doing he was at that time in a transitory state acting on something that came back into his head and he cannot be held responsible for that act because he was suffering at that time an impairment of the mind, although transitory, that affected his mental process. You wouldn't have any problem with that at all, would you? No, if there were any kind of evidence that uh, at that particular time he exhibited uh, features of psychosis and okay. would make the mental disease more tenable. Sure. So, but, but so what you're not doing is you're, you're, you're not suggesting that your discipline doesn't change from time to time, just as all other disciplines change by learning things that were not known. I mean, that's how we grow in our disciplines, right? Yes, sir. And, 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 and if your discipline, whether you agree with it or not, if your discipline as a, an, an entity starts saying, women who have been battered time and time again by their husbands who suddenly after a period of years say no more and act out that they might really be suffering at the moment that they act out because of an impairment of their mind which is transitory but substantially affected their emotional or mental processes at the time they did that you wouldn't have any problems with that right. would you my major concern uh, is the possible eroding of the concept of individual responsibility, I guess. And we all agree with that. We don't want to make a hard and fast rule on any given case that people can go out and do things, but we have to look at each case individually. You agree with that? I agree. And therefore, the woman who is being constantly beaten up 
by her husband who's coming home at 2 o'clock in the morning and whipping her and hitting her and slapping her around after a, a number of years says no more and acts out, that woman may very well have a defense that should be brought forth into a court of law. Yes. You don't have any problems with that at all. Not at all. Of course. This one I go into... Um, it's inconceivable to me that you graduated from college in 1943. I mean, you look... How old are you, doctor? Thank you. 69. Oh. Somebody opined that you got your B.A. at 16. I, well, <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I come from, a, come from a long-lived uh, family. You know, when I looked at your opinion and I looked at Dr. Palermo's opinion, I think that he had, uh, and I'm not suggesting that, that you, obviously, the two of you didn't sit down and come up with the same thing. You arrived at the same conclusions. But I noticed that he uh, brought in a couple of things that you didn't, and that, I think only one thing, and that was fetishistic. Uh, was there creatures of fetishism? Yes, I would say press that that could have been included. Did you, do you did you think that uh, Mr. Dahmer was saving these things as trophies? Yes. He didn't believe that he had plans to kind of trophyize his um, trophies by putting them on this black table that he purchased. Uh, are you aware of the fact he bought a black black table? Yes. Uh, do you know why he bought the black table? To mount the. What I call trophies, which maybe is an oversimplified term, yeah. but you know, as I said, it had artistic creative, as he described it to me, it was household artistic furnishings. Well, Mr. Dahmer has told, and of course, everybody has to say, are you embellishing or not? Um, Mr. Dahmer indicated that he was trying to make a shrine. Now, if he didn't make a shrine and all he did was mount all of his trophies on that black table that he bought, that certainly, certainly would be very, very bizarre behavior, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, if I were to tell you that I know a deer hunter who went out and shot 10 deer and went and got a table in his apartment that was a cracker box apartment and bought a black table and lined up 10 deer heads on the black table, you might say, why don't you have the fellow give me a call? Maybe I should talk to him, wouldn't you? Bizarre, right? Bizarre, but it borders on the socially acceptable, as you as I have been in uh, living rooms and dens where the unfortunate Bambi heads are mounted. It's let's, fairly gory, but uh, let's more, take, more acceptable. Let's take, the, let's take the, the analogy that the fetish is red shoes women's shoes and he goes out and buys my friend goes out and buys a black table and I walk into his apartment and I see a black table with 14 different kinds of red shoes designs and I ask him what he's doing with them and he tells me that he likes women's red shoes and I come to you and I say this guy in his living room in his small apartment you might say maybe you should talk to somebody wouldn't you <laughs> yes sir sure you would I am um, do you believe that Jeffrey Dahmer did or did not have homosexual relations when he was in the army in Germany as he had, did, by the way, did he talk to you about that? Yes, we covered it not intensively, but I understand that. it was an but area of inquiry. Yeah. Do you believe he was telling you the truth? Uh, always skeptical, if pressed to a choice, uh, I, I would say he was telling the truth. Yeah. See, I guess I'm troubled how one can say, here's a fella who's arrested by the police department. A whole bunch of evidence comes out of his apartment. And the first thing he does, if he has any intelligence, and I think you said he was highly intelligent, yes. he tells the police about murders that they didn't even know about. And the police accept that. And as we sit here today, and I don't think it can be quarreled, there are about four murders that could never have been solved, absolutely unsolvable, because without his statement, no one would get the lead. It would, they would not be solvable. I mean, there isn't even parts. It's a hypothetical. Well, I don't think it's free, being phrased in that form, Mr. Boyle. Okay, let me redo it. A hypothetical. Sure. Assume that Jeffrey Dahmer 
told the police about four murders that were absolutely unsolvable for the reasons that the body parts weren't there to make the connection, and they had no knowledge of his involvement with these people. Make that assumption. And further assume that he says the reason I killed them was because they were ugly. Just make that assumption. Can you tell us what part of that assumption would you accept as true, and what part would you have questions about? Sustained. What do you use to determine when somebody is telling the truth and lying when they are talking to you about matters where they are confessing or making statements against their penal interests? Well, a number of things. I mean, one, one would be contextual. It should fit in with other uh, knowledge of events. Uh, another would be the uh, what, what they're might be for the individual to gain by telling an untruth. Generally, the expression is heard, which I believe in people uh, lie because they're afraid to tell the truth. And in the event of the, or in the case of the possible homosexual experiences in Germany, it may be far-fetched, but perhaps he wishes to keep his military record clean, having been impressed by military discipline, and he doesn't want his discharge to be sullied. Uh, is the only thing I could think of, but as I said, I am inclined to accept his statement. Okay, let's, let's, uh, I understand. Assume that a person is a paraphilic, necrophilic, not otherwise specified. Assume that that person's object and, and accepting the definition that I read as to what a paraphilic is, okay? Yes. And assume that that person's object is to have sexual intimacy with a dead object. And further assume that that person goes out to a graveyard and digs up a coffin and removes the corpse. And further assume that that person comes back to their apartment and has sex with the corpse. And further assume that that person does that on 15 occasions. And further assume that you, as a professional, <laughs> believe in your professional psychiatric opinion that that person is having an impairment of his mind, that it has risen to the level of a psychosis, would you be unable to make that decision that this is a psychosis merely because he chooses to go to a different cemetery each time. He drives his car. He waits until the middle of the night. He brings the tools to accomplish that. He then does such a good job of reseeding and resodding the gravesite that no one could catch the fact that somebody had tampered with the grave, would you be unable to make a diagnosis of psychosis? And I'm saying you assume there's a psychosis simply because he did all of the things necessary to accomplish that goal. I'm not sure I understand. Let me let, let me review. Yeah. I, assuming that uh, the individual who does the grave robbing is psychotic. Yes, uh, that's right. Okay. Make him psychotic. Psychotic. Then. But he does all of these other things. In other words, he gets up in the morning, he puts on his clothes, he gets in his car, he takes his tools, he goes out, he digs them up, he resides, he takes it back, and he yeah. does the object of it. Is the fact that he was able to do all of these things, make all of these choices about what kind of instruments he's going to have, what time of the night he's going to go there, uh, how he's going to go to different grave sites, how he's going to reseed it so he isn't caught, 
Is th do those factors, assuming he's psychotic, prevent you from ever making the finding that he's psychotic because he's able to do things to effectuate the result? I'm going to check and he has to be very sidebar. Sidebar? Yep. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. How, how much longer are we going to be with? Not much longer. I don't think. I just want to look through the documents, notes, and just a couple of things that, that he put in. I just want to know why they were in it. Very well. I'll hear your argument, Chambers. Ellen, you have three minutes. 